Welcome to the Dr. Knoll program. It's our commitment to bring to our viewers a wide variety of medical subjects which interest uh, the community and the viewers. In this episode, we have a special program to discuss something which has become now uh, very prevalent, interesting, and widely in demand in the public. Specifically, it's about plastic surgery. In this episode, we have invited Dr. Gavin Sanderko, who is a specialist plastic surgeon, who was uh, qualified from, uh, as a doctor from Sydney University. And then he has done six years of general surgery and then four years of plastic surgery. And he's been practicing since 2007. Dr. Sanderko is also the head of the Department of Plastic Surgery at Liverpool Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Sanderko, and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And we are looking forward, I'm sure, with our viewer to get all the uh, information and knowledge you can throw on us. Thanks very much, James. Um, uh, thanks for that kind introduction. My uh, practice at Liverpool uh, focuses pretty strongly on uh, reconstruction after facial trauma and reconstruction after breast cancer. And my private practice at Norwest uh, is a more general uh, practice that deals with uh, many elective cosmetic issues as well as the, uh, the reconstructive uh, cases that patient need, the patients need doing in the private system. Um, so you, you, the main place is just in Norwest uh, sector opposite to the uh, private hospital, I believe. Is that correct? That's correct, James. Okay. Uh, look, uh, it would be uh, great if you can shed some light uh, on the differences between cosmetic surgeons and plastic surgeons. Is there any difference? Because uh, the vocabulary is used and people don't know the difference and we don't understand, you know, what's cosmetic, what's plastic surgery. So if you can give us a bit of definition and understanding how things are differentiated. Sure. Um, probably need to start with a definition of cosmetic surgery. Cosmetic surgery is an operation that's performed on a person for the sole purpose of making them look better. Um, and that's where things start to get a little bit muddy because there are many operations that uh, plastic surgeons perform where there is a functional component uh, as well as a cosmetic component. Um, cosmetic surgery as such is completely unregulated in Australia. And to date, the uh, state and federal governments have shown little um, regard for patient safety in trying to provide clear standards as to what's required uh, in terms of surgical training, as well as what's required in terms of facilities that these uh, procedures are performed in. It's probably simplest to start with what uh, a plastic surgeon is. A plastic surgeon is a doctor that has gone through uh, now five years of specialist training uh, underneath the guidance of the Royal Australian College of Surgeons. Um, it's a very intense selection process. Um, in the, this current year, 2014, there was only one uh, candidate uh, selected for the entire of New South Wales. Um, and um, out of, there were 20 that made it to the cut for an interview. Uh, and I believe that there were 60 that applied. Um, that candidate will undergo, as I said, five years of training. They'll be taught uh, everything that they need to know about the blood supply of the various parts of the body that we operate on, how they interact, the nerve supply. Um, They'll do uh, a total of 10 six-month rotations through the hospitals in Sydney, uh, and they will get taught all about uh, reconstructive surgery of all uh, places of the body, as well as cosmetic surgery of the face, body, and breast. They'll be taught pediatric plastic surgery, which involves things like cleft surgery, as well as hand surgery for uh, congenital deformities. Um, they'll be taught all about skin surgery in terms of, again, 
deformities such as vascular malformations and uh, skin cancers. Um, and they'll do some burn surgery as well as part of their, their training. Um, throughout their training, they'll be on call roughly every second day of their life. Um, and through that uh, training process, they gain a great deal of uh, experience and exposure and supervised training as to how to do things well uh, for the best result for the patient. Um, cosmetic surgery, on the other hand, is, as I said, completely unregulated. Um, there is nothing that prevents a first year graduate from university from hanging a sign on their door saying that they're a cosmetic surgeon. Uh, because it's not a protected title by the Australian Health Practitioners Regulation Agency, um, the government has decided that it's not worth um, policing. So again, as I said, um, you're comparing somebody that could be first year out of university compared to somebody that has done 10 years of surgical training. Uh, that also has an impact on how and where they can operate. So a specialist plastic surgeon, just like a specialist general surgeon or a specialist cardiac surgeon, uh, is able to use Medicare item numbers to code for their patients' operations, which allows them to admit patients to either a public hospital for some things or a private hospital for other, re uh, for other uh, procedures uh, where they've got all of the facilities to look after patients safely um, and to provide a, a good uh, recovery. Um, in contrast, a, a cosmetic surgeon uh, or a, a, a graduate or a general practitioner that, that wants to do cosmetic surgery often performs their procedures uh, in their office under sedation and local anaesthetic um, under what we would consider suboptimal conditions. So how do cosmetic uh, surgeon, or this is what they label themselves as, get their a bit of training or how they know how to do or what to do? Um, there, there is no formal training program that is uh, accredited or acknowledged by uh, the National uh, Medical Board nor by the Australian Health Practitioners Agencies. Um, their training in many procedures could be as simple as a weekend course. Well, that's very alarming and uh, it's not reassuring. So. Uh, thanks for giving us the information because I'm sure our viewers need to know, you know, what's really, I can see a vast difference, you know, all the extensive training versus just a weekend course. Correct. So obviously it's not going to be the same outcome. No. So, yeah. And is there, when it comes, for example, a difference in the way they charge or something to attract people or? Yeah. Um, of course, doing things in an unaccredited facility uh, without an anaesthetist there, without the um, fees that are required in running a complete operating theatre and recovery staff and all those sorts of things, it makes things cheaper. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, one of the um, methods of attracting patients to cosmetic surgeons is purely on, on financial basis. Um, I think that Prospective patients need to have a, a really good think of saving that extra couple of thousand dollars is actually worth risking their safety. And it's, you know, it's very common in, uh, to hear that, yeah, I've had three patients uh, or three friends see this guy and it all went well. You don't know whether the fourth one's going to be the one that really has a bad problem. What sort of risks we are looking at, you know, by not coming to a proper trained plastic surgeon? Uh, probably the greatest risk is... Uh, an inadequate knowledge of the anatomy and assessment of the patient. Um, so the most common thing that I see in through my practice that uh, I need to fix for cosmetic surgeons is that they've got a their, their ability to assess a patient and determine the right thing to do um, is very, very limited because they've got very, very limited training. Uh, it's the old story of, you know, to a man uh, with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, so their, their method of dealing with similar problems is to use the one solution, whereas similar problems need similar, similar solutions, not necessarily the same one. Uh, so just to continue from that or to elaborate on it, so where does reconstructive surgery comes into the picture? Okay. Um, 
from a plastic surgeon point of view, a reconstructive procedure is something that, re that returns the form or the function of the area of the body that we're operating on. So commonly in, in public hospital systems, we're called upon to uh, create a new breast for a lady that's had a mastectomy for breast cancer or to um, fill a hole in somebody that's had a uh, head and neck cancer or a bad uh, brain tumour where there's been some of the scalp uh, removed. Um, by learning these techniques, uh, that makes all of us better uh, cosmetic surgeons. We've got more tools in our box, um, so to speak. Okay, so let's go a bit sideways on this. You know, there are lots of practices where they might be a surgeon, but also you have a cosmetic, uh, I don't know, nurse or clerk, I don't know, yes. physician, and they do that sort of other stuff. Yes. For example, injecting Botox or putting some filler or doing, I don't know if they do laser or what they do or hair removal. Yeah. Uh, where does that fit between uh, the trained and the uh, cosmetic field? Um, that's a, a little bit more of a tough question uh, in that um, the training required to safely inject anti-wrinkle injections or to safely inject fillers, for instance, is much less intense than the training that would be required to do, say, a breast augmentation or a facelift. Um, the current uh, guidelines from the government are that uh, fillers and anti-wrinkle injections are a are an S4 drug, which means that any general practitioner can inject them and or a supervised nurse. Um, in all fairness, the, the nurse is supposed to be supervised by a doctor that is in the practice at the time. Um, lasers are even less regulated. Um, as everyone's aware, you know, there's all sorts of laser clinics and uh, around Australia uh, that have got no medical personnel at all. Um, and um, again, it's a very cutthroat market, it's very, very price driven, um, and that's, that's probably okay. Um, it, the biggest problem with any intervention on the skin is how safe is the operator? And um, there are certainly uh, laser technicians or laser practitioners out there that have got years and years of experience and are very, very good at what they do, um, but there is equally uh, a number of people that are out there that are new, hoping to make a new name for themselves, that just make mistakes and cause burns or, or problems with the skin. Um, and it's really very difficult to make a decision as to whom you're going to see and how you're going to make that decision. Um, it's my advice that you should uh, go to people that either your general practitioner uh, recommends or um, that you're, you've got several friends and colleagues that have seen uh, that have all had uh, good results. Or if you're, you're just unsure, you should see somebody that's got a medical license. So the, the people that are good with lasers, generally speaking, are the plastic surgeons and the dermatologists because part of our training encompasses the use of lasers for pigment removal, for treating vascular uh, lesions and things like that. Um, and also uh, we would use uh, laser therapy for um, skin rejuvenation in, in the face. Thank you, Dr. Sandrico. We'll take a short break and we'll come back. Welcome back to the Dr. Noel program. In this episode, we are with Dr. Gavin Sandico, a specialist plastic surgeon. Dr. Sandico, thank you very much so far. It, it's been very enlightening. And uh, to take it from there is, uh, let me ask you, what are like the main reasons or why people uh, come to you and do plastic surgery or cosmetic? Uh, or other 
uh, things like Botox or fillers. So what, what, what's your experience on these? So let's break that down into a couple of things. Uh, people that are seeing me for injectables generally are seeing me because they want to look better. Uh, they're, they're either trying to adjust wrinkles or hide wrinkles, generally speaking, hide shadows that they don't like. Um, and with any wrinkle injections and filler injections, you can now do that roughly within uh, half an hour or so. It's a fairly um, easy, relatively cheap way of just getting a bit of a touch up and, and looking fresh and, and better. Um, the fillers can sometimes cause a little bit of swelling. So, you know, if I'm injecting a large volume or an area where I think the, pa the patient will get some swelling, I'll encourage them to come the day before that they can have a day off uh, to sort of sit that out. And that's, you know, that's part of the deal. Um, a lot of plastic surgeons see a lot of patients for skin cancer reconstruction and more commonly for reconstruction on their face because everyone, you know, in Australia, skin cancer is very, very, very common. Um, and despite the fact that you've got a skin cancer, you don't want to be walking around with a, a big scar on your face if you could have possibly gotten a better result. Um, so a lot of us work in conjunction with either dermatologists or general practitioners who do the things that they're comfortable doing. And as soon as it's a bit bigger, they will send it to a, a plastic surgeon uh, so that the result will be better for the patient. Um, aside from that, my next biggest group of patients are patients that are looking for um, cosmetic breast surgery. Um, and that's everything from implants or augmentations all the way to reductions. So um, the most common patient that I see is probably a breast implant patient and they're either younger women that just feel that they're flat chested. They've got, you know, they've spent a lot of time and, and effort looking after their bodies and they just don't have the curves that they want. And that might just be unlucky genetics. Um, and in this day and age, the most reliable way of fixing that for a patient is with breast implants. Um, on the horizon is fat grafting for the right patients, and we can talk about that in another episode. Um, the next group of patients that I would probably see uh, for breast surgery are breast reduction patients. And these are women that have had large, heavy breasts, usually for a significant proportion of their life before they make the decision to do something about it. And these women live with a multitude of problems. They have shoulder pain and back and neck pain from that extra weight of the, uh, of the breast hanging off their chest. Uh, it's fairly common that they have problems with sweating underneath those uh, pendulous breasts and have problems fitting into clothes because their breasts uh, are out of proportion with the rest of their bodies. Um, a breast reduction operation is a pretty safe way of readjusting that and readjusting the shape of the breast into something that's more proportionate to the rest of the body and usually gets rid of most of the other symptoms that the women are having. None of us would be crazy enough to promise that, but it's a pretty common event. Um, the next most common thing that I would see in terms of breast surgery are women that are looking after a breast lift. And these are commonly women that have either um, had children and breastfed and their breasts have uh, sagged afterwards, or patients that have lost a lot of weight and again, the breasts are sagged as, as they've lost all the fat around the breast. And these patients, they don't really want the volume change, they just want a better arrangement. And that's all about moving the nipple into a better position and adjusting the skin underneath. Um, from there, we'd normally see, a lot of us see a lot of uh, abdominoplasties or tummy tucks, and that's got a lot of functional benefits. It's pretty common that the uneducated observer would see a tummy tuck as being a purely cosmetic procedure, something to just make a woman feel better about their tummy after, again, weight loss or uh, after children. And it's just so far from the truth. Um, usually after weight loss, or, uh, or pregnancy, the six pack muscles of the abdomen have been split, uh, split apart. There's usually a tendon between them called the linear alba. And in a young uh, adult, that linear alba is roughly about a centimeter wide. In women that have had a pregnancy and worked really hard at getting their tummy back or their body back afterwards, that linear alba can still be stretched out six or seven centimeters. And what that does is it places those muscles at a mechanical disadvantage for holding the rest of the body together. So by having a weakness of your anterior abdominal wall, you've got a couple of things that, that, that happen from that. One is uh, the back buckles. So uh, 
women afterwards often complain of this aching lower back pain that often goes away once you stitch that six pack muscles back together. The other thing that's actually very common in is stress or urge incontinence or loss of bladder control. And if you ask enough women after their pregnancy what their pelvic floor is like, all of them are looking after their pelvic floor, they're doing their Kegel exercises, but they're still saying, you know what, every so often if I go for a run or if I pick something up that's a little bit heavy, I lose a little bit of urine into my underpants. By bringing those six pack muscles back into the midline, you strengthen that and you tilt the pelvis forwards and that changes the angle of the uh, neck of the bladder and that gets rid of that. Australia wide where Australian plastic surgeons are, have entered into a, a nationwide project at the moment to try and look at those functional improvements uh, after a tummy tuck um, and try and quantify them because it's just such a poorly understood um, functional benefit after having that. Um, and then lastly, we'd go on to you know facial cosmetic surgery. Very, very common with age to look at. Um, what's happening with your eyelids? How your cheeks have dropped? And, um, and what's happening with your neck? Um, and they're all the domains of a specialist plastic surgeon. We're all trained in adjusting eyelids, re-suspending re the, the face into the position that it was more useful, re-suspending the, the skin. It's pretty uncommon that, that the skin excess is a problem, it's just the arrangement underneath. And that's got to do with gravity and, and, and use. Um, aside from that, a lot of us do a lot of reconstructive surgery. So, um, as I touched on with the skin cancer topic, uh, I do a lot of facial uh, trauma, uh, so patients that have been in big car accidents or kicked by a horse or the occasional pub fight, um, I'm called upon to put their jaw back together, put their cheekbone back together. And again, in doing those operations uh, in that manner, gives me the skills to rearrange or address a patient's specific concerns about their aging face that other uh, practitioners, other surgeons that don't have. Um, a lot of us do a lot of microsurgery for reconstruction of the head, neck, and the breast. And again, that gives us additional skills. It, it teaches, we're all taught how to take skin and fat from one part of the body and export it to another part of the body safely. And that they're all really important tools in uh, getting the best result for a patient. So, what about other benefits which people can see? Have, do you notice, because I feel that it's more of a psychological thing, and yeah. how, how does that impact, or how, do you see a difference in a person just because they've done, because th there is lots of criticism in the uh, community, ah, oh, look what you've done, uh, surgery, spend, look how much money they spend on it, was it worth it, you know, uh, you could have lived, and why you want to look a bit younger, or you want to look yeah. better. So, what's, what, what, what's your, uh, or what's our take home on that? My opinion, life's too short, you should always be happy. You need to do whatever's gonna make you happy. Um, and if adjusting things in your body is going to make you a happier person and uh, interact better with your, your friends and your family, then it's absolutely worth doing it. If it's something that's bothering you enough that you get up every morning and you think, oh my God, look at my tummy, or oh my God, look at my, 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 my breasts, then you should strongly consider whether that extra expense is worth doing it. You know, the, the same can be said about, you know, people doing up their house or getting a new car. They're all expenses that, you know, they're not going to make you uh, a better person. They're not going to uh, have a quantifiable outcome in the end. But if it makes you happy, it makes you live a better life, I think it's worth doing. Yeah, I'm assuming, you know, if, if, if something is bugging you, you're not happy with it, you always think, I think, it, it can lead to depression. Oh, absolutely. It can lead. Um, and it's, you know, uh, my, my anaesthetist in the public system would tell you that virtually every second patient that we uh, deal with um, that is having a breast reconstruction has had to live with a mastectomy shape and defect for a substantial period of time uh, whilst they've been waiting for their reconstruction. There are so many of them that are on antidepressants and that have got clinical depression. And it is, it is something that people sweep on the carpet. Body image is so tightly interacting with how people feel about themselves and how you feel about yourself has got an interaction with your mood. Your mood has got an interaction with how you deal with everyone else.
Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I'm a believer of that because uh, it's obviously these days, you know, just hearing how people commit suicide or yeah. they have depression, all this, it's things which people do not take, realize and say it's really important, whatever, as you said, whatever is going to make you happy and comfortable with your life. Uh, well, let's, we talked about the good things about yeah. it. Or what, well, let's touch a little bit about the risks. Okay, so with every operation, whenever you see a surgeon, the surgeon is supposed to divulge all the risks of the, of the operation to you and give you a week of cooling off period. That sort of gets swept under the carpet if it's a, you know, a life-saving operation. If you've got a, a bowel cancer or lung cancer, the risks are less important than just getting on with things. Um, every operation has got risks. Every time you have a sedation or a general anaesthetic, there are risks. The risks of having an operation include um, areas of your lung collapsing, a pneumonia, clots in your legs, um, in the older age group, a stroke or a heart attack, um, Obviously, the worst thing that can happen to anyone is uh, dying under an anaesthetic. Your risk in Australia, is statistically, is about one in 10 million-ish uh, for a normal, fit, healthy adult. So to put that into perspective, yes, it could happen, but you're more likely to kill yourself in the car getting to and from the hospital than in the hospital. The next batch of things that I always talk to patients about are the things that can go wrong during the operation. They're, they're the things that I've got some control over. So they are things like bleeding, uh, preventing infection, damaging things that are near to where I'm operating that I don't intend to damage. Uh, and, and I usually have a frank discussion about what the operation involves, what things are nearby, what things could get damaged as part of the operation just due to anatomical variants, um, and how the patient's gonna know all about that. Um, and then I'll talk to the patient about the things that might happen in the first week. And we have a discussion about how much blood in your dressings is too much, what infection feels like, how to get in contact with me if that happens. Um, if the patient needs a drain, uh, then the things like hematomas and seromas, um, and then all the other little things that can happen. And then I finally talk to the patient about long-term problems. And this is probably where um, many surgeons don't pay enough attention. Um, and they're things like talking to the patient about um, what might be different, the fact that Everyone is asymmetrical. If you take a photograph of somebody's face, for instance, my face, for instance, and you take my left side and flip it over and put two left sides together and put it next to two right sides, it's a completely different looking person and they look crazy. They just don't look normal. Um, so a little bit of asymmetry is completely normal for everyone. The other thing that's really important for uh, all the lady viewers out there, your breasts are not symmetrical. Put a tape measure on them, I, I'll bet you that 90% of you do not have symmetrical breasts. Your breasts are sisters, and for some of you, your breasts are cousins. Those asymmetries, most of us can fix, we can get them better, but we can't get them dead set perfect all the time. And even if we got them perfect on the table, you're gonna heal differently, left to right, and that's gotten, you know, that's something that you can't do anything about. You know, uh, and I normally talk to my patients about the fact that everyone's got a preferred side that they sleep on. You know, if you sleep preferentially on your left, that's gonna put different stresses on the scarring process on your left-hand side compared to your right-hand side, and you can't change that. You won't notice it at three weeks, you might notice it at three months, and at 12 months, you'll notice a difference. And it's all about setting a realistic expectation. And obviously, the last thing that I talk to all of my patients about is an unsatisfactory result. Everyone has complications. Anyone that says they don't have complications either doesn't operate or they're a liar. So um, you need to expect that surgery, all types of surgery, it's not carpentry. You can't just cut the right angle, use the right glue, use the right nail and expect the same outcome for everyone. You will have slightly different outcomes between 10 patients that have exactly the same operation. And it's important to realize that that is part of the deal and then to have a good relationship with your surgeon so that if something is bad, if something's bothering you, that you've got a way of adjusting that. You know, uh, and for my patients, we've got this, we have a discussion about the things that I'm prepared to fix for nothing, um, any of the costs that might be involved, uh, either from my anaesthetist or from the hospital if, it, if it's required, or whether they're things that we can do under local anaesthetic and, and I just absorb the time that's involved in uh, having a happy patient. Um, 
And probably the most important thing for all patients is to recognise that scars take at least six months to get to their stable end point. And for some operations, more like two years. And it's really, really important that if you want a good result, that you need to be involved and committed in making your scars good. So for the first three or four weeks, every scar all over the body is dumping down collagen, is putting down this random arrangement of collagen just to get strong enough. And then at around about the three to four week mark, your body says, hey look, I've got enough scaffolding here. What I need to do is now rearrange that scaffolding into the right alignment. And so it sends in blood vessels with new cells and those cells tear down that scaffolding and rearrange it. And it's at that point in time that you can do all the things to start making your scar better. It's things like scar massage, it's things like silicon sheeting, it's things like laser therapy if you need it. Um, and all of those add to a good result. Um, it's fairly common uh, that I see a big difference between my public patients who don't really pay enough attention to that to my private patients whom they're coming to me because they want a good result and they're, they've got as far as they're concerned, they've paid for a good result. They've got skin in the game and they want a good result. They work a lot harder and at six and at 12 months you can tell the difference. Thank you Dr. Senderko for uh, the informative session and we'll hope to see you again on this program. Uh, thanks to our viewers for watching. I hope you got the most out of it and we'll see you next time.